Everybody, up next, um, we're going to be hearing from a good friend, another good friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Terry Walls is a world-renowned physician, researcher, and author of the Walls Protocol. And like Cynthia, she's also, Terry is an incredible badass who walks the walk and talks the talk. Uh, Terry had progressive multiple sclerosis that landed her in a tilt recline wheelchair after failing conventional medical treatments. And so her personal journey really is inspiring, talking about how we can utilize food and diet and lifestyle to really just sort of optimize her health to the point where she's able to ride her bike to work, at least when they let us all go into work. So Terry, I see that you're with us here and we can get you uh, to join us with the video. It'll be perfect. There she is. And it looks I like should be unmuted now. All right. What? Well, it looks like we all need to do our cool glasses for the rest of the time. Yes, huh? I, I, I went and got my cool glasses. I didn't want to be uh, left <laughs> out. Uh, so I uh, hope the glare is not a problem. No, actually, it's crazy. I've never actually been able to look at somebody else in the same one. These are the ones from Dave, right? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so they're very red uh, and uh, they are very potent at making it easier for my brain to make the appropriate amount of melatonin. So absolutely, when I wear the red glasses, when I don't do uh, interviews late at night or watch my phone or TV, my uh, sleep is much better. Nice. And particularly, particularly if I couple that with taking a walk outside. So I'm being very attentive to take time to uh, do a walk uh, sometime during the, uh, ideally the morning, certainly uh, over the noon hour if I miss the morning. Uh, so I get my, uh, take my dog out for a walk. Uh, I often I convince my daughter to come along with me. Nice. Uh, and that, that way I get some uh, sunlight into my eyes. I set those um, biologic time sensing uh, cells in the back of my retina that talk up to, uh, to my brain. Uh, again, for those bio biologic time sensing cells um, and so everything stays synchronized and as long as I'm not inter confusing my eyes with more blue light at night then I'll make melatonin appropriately. Yeah you know it's interesting because I turned all of my uh, I have the night shift on my uh, phone all the time I've got the computer screens all turned down and then you know of course to get nice lighting you have to turn it all up and of course we do a lot of this at night so everybody can join us but um, so you know that, I mean, and, and Cynthia and I started to talk about it, and I think that most people expect you and I to start talking about food, which I know we will, yes, but yes. What, 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 what is this melatonin thing? Because, I mean, you just told us why we, you know, what you do to Correct. keep it around, well, but why do we care? So uh, we have a diurnal secretion of uh, many of our hormones. Uh, that uh, match the day-night cycle. Cortisol is up in the morning, uh, down in the afternoon. Uh, melatonin comes up in the evening. Uh, and it turns out that melatonin is a very potent antioxidant in the brain. And uh, there's more research coming out that melatonin has antiviral capabilities. And melatonin appears to be a really important in the uh, clearance of the amyloid out of the brain. Mm. And, uh, and what, what many people may not realize is that amyloid in the brain is uh, sort of a, a last defense antimicrobial. It's a protein that will help um, the brain protect itself from viruses, from bacteria. So in fact, making amyloid is a good thing because mm -hmm. it's an antimicrobial defense but then you need to be able to clear it out of your brain at night. Uh, and so you wanna have low insulin levels because uh, that, that will support clearing your amyloid. And you want to have plenty of melatonin and you want to have plenty of sleep. Ah, that's one of my favorite topics is the sleep thing because yeah. it's, it's interesting because the work that I do a lot with Lyme disease and other chronic infections we're finding that amyloid is act in the amyloid um, plaques in these neurofibrillary tangles of like Alzheimer's, we're actually finding spirochetes from Lyme. Now, 
we're finding we're not, all sorts of microbes, right? That we don't want in our brain. So chlamydia, pneumonia, like. So we absolutely want to be able to make amyloid. Amyloid's a very important part of our defense mechanisms, but we have to be able to clear the amyloid if we've made it. Uh, so making amyloid is not the problem. Failure to clear amyloid that was made in defense is right. very much a problem. And so for anyone watching who's, I, I think a lot of us have heard about the lymphatic system where we're draining um, the talk, you know, the, all the lymphatic fluid parts of the immune system, washing away sort of toxins. In the brain, it's a little different. And the sy system is called the glymphatic system. And it's basically the main way that we're detoxifying our brain from things. And one of the primary things it mo mobilizes is amyloid. And the process seems to be, and I've read anything from 70 to 90% of the activity of this system is while we're sleeping. And it's looking mm -hmm. even like it's deep sleep. Deep sleep. Yes. Yes. So that's uh, one of the reasons people may have heard me talk about uh, taking a cold bath or an ice bath before going to bed, that dropping your core temperature will shorten the time to fall asleep it will shorten the time to fall into deep sleep and it will give you a longer period of deep sleep. Um, so you can do a long cold shower, you could do a cold bath, you could do an ice bath, uh, you could do some of the Wim Hof um, mm -hmm. uh, ice, ice training uh, techniques. Guilty. <laughs> yep, so, so all of these are really very, very uh, powerful tools. And, and, and if you look at our ancestors, our Brunhildes and Beowulfs uh, of our uh, ancestral mothers and fathers, you know, before we had ho houses, homes, we slept outside and mm -hmm. we we're on the ground, air temperature always dropped. Um, so our, the ambient sleeping temperature always dropped. Our core temperatures dropped during the night when we created clothing, that was an advantage. Um, we, then we created shelter. Then we created uh, air conditioning, heating systems. Actually, first it was heating systems, then eventually air conditioning systems. Mm -hmm. And we steadily uh, made more narrow the temperature with which we live. And that decreases our resilience. Decreases mm -hmm. our resilience considerably. I talk about this in my book that it's really important for us to have gentle temperature stress. So I want people to be hot and sweat, uh, not dangerously so, but I want to expand the zone of temperatures that you can live and operate in. So I, I think it's a reason to go outside. Uh, right. Every day, uh, appropriately attired. Um, go outside, sweat go outside, be cool, you know, dress appropriately. I don't want you to become hypothermic, but I do want you to be exposed to those cold temperatures. Uh, and it's a reason uh, to take saunas. It's a reason to uh, take cold showers. It's a reason to take cool baths, uh, uh, cold baths. And then if you uh, are so inclined to train uh, for it, ice baths. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, because that whole process to me is, it, it, Cynthia and I were talking about using intermittent fasting to stimulate autophagy, but cold exposure as well as exercise can also stimulate autophagy, which leads right. to longevity. And now, I'll, I'll throw I, another. I, go ahead. I, I want to put this in context of uh, COVID nineteen, though. Yes. So uh, I, I'm very fond of uh, hormesis. That intermittent. That's stress. what I was just going to ask you about. <laughs> <laughs> Intermittent stress followed by rest, recovery, and repair. Uh, and so yeah, there's a lot of debate and conversation that I'm having with other uh, Institute for Functional Medicine faculty about how much hormesis is appropriate during uh, the time that we're all facing COVID. Uh, what level of stress is good? Uh, mild is good, moderate is good or is moderate good, or how, how far can we go? Uh, because uh, I'll take what, where we have a great deal of agreement. Um, a water fast 
uh, or a five-day periodic fast, um, or even the five-day periodic calorie restriction, the fasting-making diet. In animal models, all of those show that the immune cells fall, mm -hmm. uh, and, and depending on the animal model, it might fall uh, by as much as 30%. This is not the time to have your immune cells drop by 30%. Right. So I, I, we're all uh, feeling very comfortable saying, this is not the time to do a water fast, to do a periodic fast. Uh, and and uh, we, we don't want people doing that. The intermittent calorie restriction, we're not quite so clear. But certainly if you're having any symptoms, we don't want you to do that. Right. Some of us, uh, and I'm inclined to, to be concerned because we can have this virus without symptoms, I'd rather you not depress your immune cells during that asymptomatic phase uh, out of the abundance of caution. So I would not do calorie restriction during this time, mm -hmm. and I would probably not do a five-day uh, uh, calorie restriction, that fast-making diet during this time period. Yeah. Then the next question comes down to, well, what about time-restricted feeding? What about intermittent fasting? Uh, and here we have a variety of opinions. Um, uh, uh, and uh, some are uh, more comfortable uh, with a 500-calorie-restricted uh, uh, day, uh, two days a week. Um, some are more comfortable with a 16-hour time-restricted feeding during that time period. In there, I think my response is, if that's your usual pattern, exactly, I, I think that's fine. It is not the time to start a 500 calorie day, uh, two days a week during this time period. I, I think I could be okay with you starting a 12 hour uh, time restricted feeding if that's new to you. Um, but I would, I would be very slow at going to the, a 16 hour time restricted feeding. Uh, some of my colleagues are, are much more comfortable uh, telling folks to do that. I think it depends on the circumstance. Because we know blood sugar dysregulation is so bad for you that if your right. sugars are really high, and this is a way to get your sugars in better control, then the benefit of a better sugar control uh, it makes it worthwhile. Well, and I've been saying the whole time, Terry, is like if, if, you're, if you are a person who has a lot of sugar... Let's cut down on your sugar. I'm not suggesting we do a wholesale, just like if you're drinking three sodas a day, just get rid of all of them right away. I'm saying you should be working in that place because I don't think anybody yeah. should be drinking a soda. But as, as an example, if you were to just over time work in that direction, because if you cut out like a whole can of soda, you're going to be decreasing your sugar. But I'm worried about the additional stress you know, emotionally and also in the microbiome right. changes. We, we, we don't want to have uh, um, withdrawal. We don't want to have high cortisol. So, I, I, and I want you to do things that you and your family can embrace and be successful. Replacing uh, 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 sweetened beverages with water as much as you can. Replacing sugar with uh, uh, things that are good for you. Uh, fruit that you can peel uh, would be good for you. Right. Um, uh, even if you're the standard American diet and you're adding more non-starchy vegetables, more legumes, a uh, whole grains, so more of a Mediterranean diet, that's clearly a step in the right direction. Um, so the more we can improve the overall quality of the diet, I, uh, I think that is marvelous. Uh, and if you're up for starting the Walls diet, I think that would be excellent but I want you to do it at a pace that you and your family can comfortably achieve. Well, you know, it's interesting. So to me, the one, the one piece that I really love about hormesis, which is where we're doing that mild to moderate stress so that for a, a duration of time and a level of stress that doesn't become a toxin, doesn't become a problem, is it, there's like you said, there's the rest and the recovery, but there's also another word I love to add in there is it requires you to be able to adapt to adapt, yes. right? So we have, yeah. it's, re, it's recovery and adaptation. And so to me, if I were to go and hop on, you know, you know, walls, paleo, keto, you know, squared, 
like my body's not going to be able to adapt to that quickly. Whereas what I want to do is make a change then that stresses me a little, then I adapt and then I can move on. And that window of like, for me, I exercise a lot. And so for, I can keep, I can exercise at a certain intensity and not suppress my immune Correct. system because I've worked up to that. You've worked up to that. Um, I, I would also uh, caution people who, who maybe are great athletes uh, I, that still, this is still a time to have moderate intensity for you as an athlete. It's not the time to have the ultra endurance experience. So Absolutely. It, so in my tribe, uh, a moderate intensity might be a walk around the block half mile, uh, and they want to really push themselves. And so it'd be a real struggle to do two miles. They'd be flat out exhausted and couldn't function. That would be catastrophic. We want you to do moderate intensity, uh, but I don't want you to do uh, a ultra endurance activity for you. Right. And so, you know, maybe for you, that would be running a, doing a Ironman uh, <laughs> in one you day. You give me a little too much credit. <laughs> a little too much. Okay. <laughs> we, we do know in Italy, it's, it's pretty interesting, uh, the folks who competed in marathons uh, and a um, ultra distance for that individual can be a very inflammatory event. Mm -hmm it may increase the risk for a more inflammatory response uh, to COVID. So moderate exercise that, that is it within your usual capability, I, I'm, I'm totally fine with. Right. Going far beyond your usual athletic uh, activity, I would rather you not do. I agree. You know, I tell people a lot too, because in my tribe, it's, you know, not everybody's, um, regain their health to the level I have to be doing this crazy stuff. But we, I talked to them about doing things like you think you can do a mile walk, right? You're, you're pretty sure that that's the mo the moderate that you can do safely today. So do 70% of that because I find that a lot of people, when they're really trying to get back on track, I, mean, I think there's two people. There's the people trying to get back on track. We don't want them to accidentally overdo it. The other side of that is some people need a little push to do a little more. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yes. I think it's, it's, it's really important to remember, though, that like all of these are tools, like food is a tool for us and exercise is a tool. And we need, you know, we, we don't want to go in extreme in any direction. It, so it sounds like what you're saying. Correct. Correct. You know, another thing that uh, we've been talking about uh, I, I think most people are aware that this is a respiratory transmitted uh, infection. However, there's also now clear evidence that some people with COVID end up with vomiting, profound diarrhea that looks very much like cholera, mm -hmm. which again, in the conversation I'm having with my faculty colleagues are, we think the, the biology of the fact that some people have what looks like cholera to me suggests that this is also a food born, which cautious now, uh, want it to, because that drops the pitch down uh, and makes it less likely that we're going to have active virus or troublesome bacteria. There. Mm. So I, I'm telling my tribe, now's the time to learn how to make sauerkraut um, and have your cooked vegetables, which when you cook vegetables, you decrease your vitamin C content. So you're either going to have fruit you can peel. So citrus would be really great. Uh, and sauerkraut. Our an uh, ancestors figured out that the sailors that used to die of scurvy when they started feeding these sailors sauerkraut or citrus, they didn't die of scurvy. Uh, and so again, for hundreds of years, that's how our ancestors survived with sauerkraut in the root cellars. Mm -hmm. So they would have plenty of vitamin C in their root vegetables that they cooked uh, and uh, meat. 
Right. You know, I think, I think it's so important that there's so many different places to get the nutrients we talk about. It's not just vitamin C from, you know, orange juice and getting a, a you know, like an IV of pure sugar. Um, you know, and there, there are those different places to get it from. You know, it's, in, it's interesting, too, because we talk about COVID-19 and the ACE2 receptors on, you know, on the um, cells in, in the respiratory tree and in the alveoli and everything. But there's also, from my understanding, a pretty high concentration of those ACE2 receptors that the virus docks on in the enterocytes, in, in the, you know, in sort the of gut. the cells in the gut. You know, so it's, it, it's, in, it's interesting to see where it's, where it's going to all pan out. But I think the things we can do to keep our gut as healthy as possible are critical here. Correct. And it, it raises the question, uh, this is a new virus. We don't fully understand all of the routes of transmission yet. Clearly, uh, coughing, sneezing is a big route. Uh, is fecal oral another route? Uh, we don't know. I don't have any studies that identify that. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just advising people to be cautious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting too. I found some papers showing that, you know, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, ex is very sensitive to changes in pH both up and down. So if it's more acidic or more alkaline, as well as heat, you know, and I've seen different numbers, but somewhere in the roughly 140 degree Fahrenheit range, but that it can be actually frozen and, and it won't do much to it, you know, which again, I mean, theoretically, if that's true, that an acidic environment will be bad, going through the stomach acid should neutralize it, but we, there's a whole bunch of path, pathogens that it should, should get neutralized in the stomach acid and they don't. Well, and the other question is, are you making stomach acid? How many of us can no longer make stomach acid very well or are taking medication that suppresses our stomach acid? Uh, a lot of folks are taking antacids. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, they may have heard uh, me talk about the benefits of alkalinizing and they may have decided to go down the uh, alka seltzer gold route with sodium potassium bicarbonate, which alkalinizes you and, and that's good, but it may decrease your stomach acid. Or they may be going down the apple cider vinegar, lime juice, lemon juice route, which is also paradoxically alkalinizing, but it keeps your stomach acid up. So that that's the, the alkalinizing route that I've that I'm choosing. Yeah, because didn't I see a picture on your website that shows like your glass you in front of the computer with the glass of water and this huge thing apple cider vinegar sitting yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's not so, that I'm drinking the apple cider vinegar straight. But I was teaching my tribe, like, okay, here's a way you can alkalinize. And of course, they were very confused, like, how can I alkalinize drinking dilute apple cider vinegar? Right. So I, I had to explain that paradoxically, you can do it with the uh, bicarbonate, uh, or we can do it with the apple cider vinegar uh, and uh, lime juice, lemon juice, because those are metabolized um, that way. Yeah. So, so, and I, I've, I've been a, cause I've for a long time used things like lemon and lime in my, you know, Herxheimer or treatment flare sort of detoxification protocols. And I, people are always like, really, if I acidify my gut, it'll make me more alkaline. <laughs> it, it is confusing. Um, it is confusing to people. Yes. So is there a 37 and a half second or 90 second version that we can share with people? So, uh, you mean about why apple cider How it vinegar? happens, yeah. Um, it increases the uh, stomach acid. You're pulling less, uh, by less mineral from your skeleton, uh, and therefore you have less draw uh, into your uh, bloodstream uh, in terms of uh, uh, needing to pull more, uh, bone, more bone mineral more mm -hmm. calcium magnesium out of your skeleton into your bloodstream to neutralize the acid. Nice. Well, and, and so it, to me, it's so impressive that like, so guys, this is like Terry Walls is telling us how to heal ourselves with food,
but there's all this science behind it. And that's one of the, 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 the things that I find, Terry, that's really tough with what's been going on in this particular coronavirus situation is like you're basing so much of what you're talking about on you know, gazillions of years of research, but now we're sitting here where we don't know all the right answers and we're trying to utilize the best information in front of you know, us. I mean, how do you do that? So, uh, you know, I'm watching uh, people talk about the benefits of taking uh, 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 a variety of supplements to create these mechanistic supports for uh, attaching, attaching or attacking COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But what I want everyone to understand is when we look at these mechanism studies, nearly all of our um, supplement studies are based on food studies that are done epidemiologically that say these nutrients are really great for um, reducing the risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes. And then we do a, and so we know the nutrients important. We do a supplement study and nearly always the supplement study is disappointing or harmful. And that's because the nutrient in food is very beneficial. Food is complex and has this complicated you know, relationships with other nutrients in our food. The message I want everyone to hear is that the food you eat will be vastly more important than whether you're taking vitamin C, zinc, uh, resveratrol, curcumin, or any of that other stuff. Quercetin. It's the yep. food. It is the food. It is the food. <laughs> you cannot supplement a, your way out of a crappy diet and expect to have a good outcome. These are all theoretic ideas when we're talking about vitamin C, zinc, quercetin, curcumin, resveratrol based on the same type of observational studies that we have used to propose supplement studies that often fail. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I, I'm not uh, trying to argue against taking those supplements, you can take them, but the far more important decision you're gonna make is, are you eating vegetables? Mm -hmm. Are you having garlic? Are you having cabbage? Are you having sauerkraut? Are you having sufficient protein? Are you having omega-3 fats and omega-6 fats? That's what's going to make you healthy and more vital and more resilient. And that will be far more powerful than whether or not you're taking any particular supplement cocktail that, and, I, and I'm part of the you know, IFM faculty that's recommending these supplement cocktails. So it's not that I don't think that there's no role for supplements. Right. But the role for food is vastly more important. Uh, Terry, thank you so much for saying that because to me, it's like I'm, I'm always trying to give people the tools that they can take advantage of at home. And am I taking a little extra immune boost now? Yes. Am I taking uh, like a little bit of a multivitamin to make sure that I'm not missing anything because some days we go to the store and can't get the everything we want? Sure. But um, I'm, I, I couldn't have said it. I mean, no one can say it better than that. I mean, it's just so important to be able to eat real food. And I, I think that puts the onus on us to actually have to care for our own health. And our own health is our own health. And we, have the, we are the number one person who is in charge of and responsible for ourselves. Now, uh, one of the strategies that have been really important for me for my mental health is... Uh, thinking about, you know, this is a circumstance that none of us want. Um, we're all experiencing loss, strain, difficulty. Uh, and with any loss, there's this typical denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance. <laughs> and we finally, you know, and we individually and our uh, business organizations and our regional and federal governments are all in varying states of uh, denial to acceptance. And then you need to go to the next place. Could either be acceptance and say like, okay, there's nothing I can do. I'm either going to succumb to this illness or not. Or I could say, well, I'm going to learn and do, take, do a better job of taking care of myself, see what there is to learn so I could put myself in a better circumstance. In those individuals and families and local, regional, and federal governments that figure out okay, we don't like this circumstance, but by God, I'm going to learn and do the best that I can, we'll do better. So I, I'm looking at um, 
us as a society. And I see many people admitting that they're cooking for the first time, learning how to improvise with the recipe, like, okay, I don't have all those ingredients, but okay, I don't have them. I'll, I got to make with what I've got on hand because yeah. I, I, I don't get to go to the store now. Uh, so we're learning to improvise. Um, we are learning to spend time together as a family that we aren't rushing around so much anymore. We are learning to help our kids with their homework. We are learning to pray, to meditate, to be mm-hmm. mindful. Um, we're learning that, well, I don't quite know what's happening, um, but I'm going to uh, try and learn and see other things that I could do. Uh, my extended family members who, who sort of thought I'm pretty eccentric and a little odd with my ideas are now calling me and asking me like, okay, so- How can I do this? Do you have any, is there anything I should be doing? <laughs> so uh, it's, we all, the more that we can move from acceptance, there's nothing I can do to acceptance. I got to learn as much as I can about what I could do what might be helpful. Um, and I, I'm, I'm encouraged that there are more and more of us in society that are taking the decision, well, I have to learn and be more proactive. Mm-hmm. It, it, Terry, I mean, just mind boggling, because it it's, it's totally that the next step is like, we also have to accept the fact that we have so much control here. I think we've grown up in the society where we're told we don't have the control over our health, but what you're telling us is we actually do. So, well, here's, so here's the reality. Um, vaccines aren't going to save us. Mm-hmm. We don't have drugs that are going to save us. Uh, we have drugs that might be a little bit helpful. Oxygen's a little bit helpful. Ventilators are a little bit helpful um, and uh, potentially life-saving. But most of us, the things that are going to really help are not smoking, eating more vegetables, meditating, sleeping, uh, going outside, getting some vitamin fresh D, air. sunlight, getting fresh air, um, having uh, uh, as, as many uh, mindful, prayerful interactions with myself and my environment and my family to keep my cortisol under control. So this is all about self-care. You know, when we spoke uh, earlier, you know, I, I made the observation that, you know, pandemics have been going on for about a billion and a half years. And we've been having <laughs> right. this, this um, arms race between the microbes and everything that was bigger than a microbe for a billion and a half years or a billion years, however long we've had both forms of life. And they'll go on forever. Our, our children and all of our descendants will have the same fight. And it's always mm-hmm. going to be the same thing. It is always going to be distancing, soap and water, and self-care. That's going to determine who has the best chance of flourishing. Yeah. Terry, thank you for sharing your love and your wisdom with us as always. This has been remarkable. Um, you know, just, I, I'm so grateful for you sharing with, with this group and for our friendship and, you, you know, your total inspiration to me, as I've told you before, I've, I mean, even in the beginning of my career, when I was trying to learn what the heck uh, a healthy eating lifestyle was, you're the, you were the first, your book and protocol was the first sort of place that I went to as a resource. So heartfelt thanks for all you do. And um, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you, Tom. All right. Have a great evening. Love to you and your family and your whole tribe. Okay. Thank you. So everyone, thank you so much to Terry Walls for an amazing time chatting. And she just reminded me of a Marianne Williamson. Here we go. Let's start that one over. Marianne Williamson quote. Um, Because, you know, she said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond belief beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. And I think what Dr. Terry Walls is sharing with us is we have an amazing uh, ability to support our healing and support our longevity 
and our immune system through the actions we have. And one of the things Terry mentioned was that we need to, you know, kind of start being a little more creative in the kitchen.